Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to back to Whistle Gig Martial Arts Radio, episode 173. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I'm probably one of the biggest fans of martial arts you're ever going to meet. Thanks for tuning in. Today on episode 173, we're going to talk about martial arts belts and the paradox, the contradictions that come up when we talk about belts and rank. I want to thank you for being here today. If you want to check out the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can also find 172 other episodes, including interviews with famous martial artists, everyday martial artists, good friends of mine, strangers, everybody in between, as well as these Thursday episodes where we talk about different subjects usually. Make sure you're subscribing so you don't miss out because we release at least two episodes a week. And I say at least because last week we did three. If you want to check out the stuff that we make at Whistlekick, you can check that out at whistlekick.com. All one word. Don't have to worry about capitalization, hyphens, underscores, nothing silly like that. W-H-I-S-T-L-E-K-I-C-K.com. I spell that more than you might think. Let's talk about belts. Back on episode 61, yeah, it was quite a while ago, we talked about the history of belts and rank and really what that meant to the martial arts. For those of you that haven't been around with us that long, or maybe you haven't gone back and dug through the old episodes, which I'd really encourage you to do. We've set up these episodes so that they're not tied to any specific point in time. This episode will be just as relevant in five years as it is today. Jigoro Kano, who founded Judo, for those of you that don't recognize that name, he first used a black belt to denote rank in 1883. He started with a white belt and a black belt, and that was it. That was all they had back then. And it was more than 20 years. It wasn't until 1903, maybe a little bit later, it's a little fuzzy, that they started adding colored belts. Prior to that, it was all certificates. You would be awarded a certificate just in the same way that right now, in most schools, we're awarded belts or stripes or things like that. The original intention of a black belt, and I'm going to quote myself here, which is kind of fun to do. The original intention of a black belt was to show that a martial artist had competency of the style's basic techniques and principles. In Japanese, a first-degree black belt is referred to as a shodan, which literally means first step. It doesn't imply any level of perfection, but rather an ability to use the concepts and skills they've learned. A good way to equate it to modern, non-martial education would be to think of it as a bachelor's degree from a university. When you consider the belt across all martial arts disciplines, you can see a lot of paradox. That's really the best word for me when I consider it. So many of us care about our belts as an outward symbol. But yet when we take them off, we know the exact same. We're the same person. Some schools won't allow you to let the belt touch the floor if you're not wearing it. And yet many of those same schools instruct you to not wash it. In modern times, we clean the things that we care about. Different schools, of course, do different things to show your outward progression of rank. Maybe it's stripes. Maybe you put your name on your belt. Of course, different colors. And others, you know, you keep the same, at least black belt, the entire time you've been training. I've worn one black belt since I first earned my black belt at 16. It's worn. It's frayed. I'm lucky in that it's a fairly heavy-duty belt that I was awarded back then because it's still holding together. I remember one time, my one of my original instructors... She had been doing the same thing. She wore a more colored belt. I think she was a fifth degree at that time. And during ceremonial things, she would wear that belt, but she preferred her original black belt. And one day she was tightening it and pulled a chunk of it off. And I don't just mean a couple threads. I mean, you know, a good four or five inches came off in her hand. And she sewed it back on because that belt was really important to her, just as my belt is really important to me. But why? It's, it's a symbol. On these Thursday shows, I spend sometimes a lot of time doing research. It depends on the subject, depends on how much I know about it. If it's for a movie or a person, I'll put a lot of time in. And as I did the research for this episode, I found nothing conclusive about the way we handle our belts. Lots of opinions, lots of differences, absolutely no consensus. Why do we put so much emphasis, so much respect, uh, so much credibility into a belt. And when I think back, when I was younger, 
I grew up in a, a traditional karate school. Long-time listeners know that. I don't talk about that a lot because the show isn't really about me. But here, I think it's really appropriate. And I thought that the rule in my original school was a common one. You weren't supposed to let the belt touch the ground unless you were wearing it. I was told it was a symbol of disrespect to yourself and your training and your instructors and the arts to do that. Okay, fine. You know, I, I didn't know any better. I never questioned it. And then I moved to Vermont and I started training in Taekwondo, where I saw people tossing their belts on the floor. And I was flabbergasted. I just was blown away. And it forced me to take a step back and realize, oh, okay, everybody doesn't have that rule. Different schools treat belts differently. In the same school, when someone attains a red belt, they kneel to put it on and take it off. And there's some other symbolism in there, but it's around rank. It's around the belt and the respect that go into that rank. So there's a paradox even in the school that I train in now. Why do we have such different approaches? Why are there so many things that are just contradictory about belts in general? I alluded to it before. It's because it's a symbol. Symbols themselves are often contradictory. And if we think of the greatest practice in most of our lives that involves symbolism, religion, there's a ton of contradiction in there. We value the belt because it's a symbol of our efforts, of the time that we've put in training, the blood, sweat, and tears, the knowledge, the fact that we're a better person. Most arts have some sort of belt system, and most martial arts have a black belt. And for almost all of those arts, earning a black belt is a big deal. In popular culture, people know that having a black belt is a big deal. And that wouldn't be true if it wasn't virtually universal that having a black belt was a big deal in martial arts schools. The way we treat the belt differs because we have different ways of showing respect. Those different ways have been passed down from our instructors, from their instructors. When I think about it, I've added personal elements to the way I handle my belt that no one ever taught me. Things that if I have a school again, you know, I may have my students do them. Would those practices be right or wrong? No, of course not. We get trapped in what we're asked to do in a school, and sometimes we forget that there is no right or wrong. Other schools do things differently, like toss their belts on the floor, and that's perfectly acceptable. It's when we get dogmatic about those practices that it really gets dangerous. We stand up, we declare that there's a right way to handle a belt and a wrong way, and the right way is what I do, and the wrong way is anything else. Well, my right way and yours don't have to be the same. We still practice martial arts. We're still out for personal development. We're out to become better people and to make those around us better people. To me, that's really the ultimate paradox of belts. Across every martial art, we see the importance of them. But we all express that importance so differently that sometimes we argue about it. It's just a piece of cloth. It holds your pants up. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your time today. If you want to leave some feedback, you can do that on social media. We're Whistlekick on Facebook. YouTube, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and maybe even Google Plus once in a while. <laughs> you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can check out what we offer at whistlekick.com. You can look at the show notes or other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We would love to have you share this episode or another episode with someone that maybe hasn't found the show yet. We get emails all the time from new listeners, and I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate those emails. I love them. For now, I get to respond to everyone personally. It's getting a little tougher, and I know that someday we won't be able to do that, that I won't be able to respond to every email personally. But as long as I can do it, I'm going to. I'll, I'll lose sleep before I go quite that far. Not all my sleep, but some of it. <laughs> really, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.